Okay, welcome everyone to this continuation of what is algebraic geometry. Today we will finally dive into projective world. It's finally time to think about projective space, uh, projective varieties, projective stuff. Uh, because projective is projective, which is somewhat more difficult. It looks more difficult, but it actually is easier. So it's one of these rare examples where, or maybe some examples that appears from time to time in mathematics, we kind of make something more difficult, at least the definition is more demanding, but actually the properties of the spaces are easier. And projective space is an example of this type. It's easier, I claim it's easier than affine space. Projective varieties are in some sense easier than affine varieties. But before we talk about projective varieties, I will talk about projective space itself, which is really this idea of, yeah, let's meet at a, let's meet at the horizon. Let's meet at infinity. So let me make that reasonably uh, clear. Okay, just as a reminder, a variety is a patchwork, and here's my favorite picture of a patchwork. So a variety is something that is patched together from um, affine varieties. And we want kind of the, the whole point, the whole selling point of doing this is kind of manifolds, and a lot of manifolds are compact. But since affine varieties are an example of a variety, a variety is not, not immediately compact, right? They're non-compact non varieties. And I would rather, first step we would rather like to do is to describe a nice set of compact varieties, and these are the projective varieties, right? So affine varieties, rarely compact, part of the definition of a variety, projective varieties, compact, part of the definition of a variety. But they are somehow easier than general varieties, because we can actually write down like coordinates for them and so on. And uh, yeah, what is actually projective space is kind of then the main thing to study because affine varieties are zero sets in affine space and projective varieties should be zero sets in projective space. That's exactly what it is. So kind of really easy correspondence, affine varieties, zero sets in affine space, projective varieties, zero sets in projective space and yeah so to, in order to make to, to in order to really make sense of this i should tell you what actually projective space is and it's a pretty beautiful idea um, which hopefully you have seen at one point if not then we will do it now um but, so the, pro the problem is so this kind of came out of something different we come back to that later but eventually people realize projective is easier than um, non-projective, so affine, so classical, whatever you want to call it, classical geometry, affine geometry, because you have fewer special cases. This is kind of a really, really crucial selling point of projective land. Let me just call it projective land. Projective land, where everyone wants to go. Projective land, um, because you kind of have fewer special cases. So in affine land, <laughs> affine land, you can have two different pictures, two lines, Cross or two lines don't cross. Generically, they cross. So if you just randomly generate two lines, they will cross. But there's this one, one extra silly case where the lines are parallel and they don't cross. Right. So this is essentially lines should cross. But it's, it's a little bit wrong, but not terribly wrong. It's not completely wrong. Right. It's just one special case out of infinitely many which actually work very well. Um, so, and the idea is to kind of fix that by just adding a point at infinity where they meet. And that's, that's what projective geometry does. And in the end, you have fewer kind of special cases. So if you think about something like uh, a Pappus theorem, where certain lines should intersect in a certain type of object, then you usually have something like in affine geometry, in classical geometry. Oh, this is true. Big theorem, beautiful theorem is true, unless line X is parallel to line Y or blah, blah, blah. and then 17 special cases. And this is like very annoying because the theorem itself is so beautiful. But if you write it down, you have 17 special cases and it looks like the 17 special cases are the important ones. Well, they're really not. And then when you formulate that in projective geometry, there are no special cases. Everything is generic and you just have the beautiful theorem. That's essentially my selling point for projective geometry, right? In projective geometry, you somehow get rid of this problem in quotation marks that things not, don't need to cross. And then the, the many, many other problems, again, in quotation marks uh, will vanish as well. 
and my, my kind of went by picture so kind of this really beautiful picture of uh, uh, the projective line circle and the classical line is a line um, and the relation between them is a stereographical projection and one of them is compact the classical line the line is not compact and the projective line the sphere is uh, compact and the relation between them is a spherical uh, projection which I could run all day in this nice illustration here so uh, the green point and the red point correspond to one another and this point at infinity kind of pokes out to infinity so you draw uh, a line between uh, the green point and the red point that meets at the point at infinity which completely determines that line and that's called the spherographical projection and that's the relationship between um, the affine world the green one at the bottom and the projective world the red one at the top yeah and the, the projective one is, see is a bit bigger and has a point at infinity but this is a relationship which um, in, in the end essentially what I just showed you is uh, kind of making it projective projectivization or the project projectivization just as a classical illustration as a stereographical projection i hope that it makes sense so careful here a uh, projective line is actually a circle so um in particular it is compact which is the whole point uh, about projective and i'm not going to well here here we go i'm not going to dwell on this for too much but essentially what you do is projective space is this equivalence class of lines fine the better way of thinking about it, well, arguably, the better way of thinking about it is that in projective space, you don't have standard coordinates, but you have projective coordinates, sometimes called homogeneous coordinates, which I usually write in terms of those uh, square brackets. And they have this one extra feature that um, you can just scale them. Uh, projective geometry is geometry up to scaling. You can just scale them arbitrarily and it won't change. The corresponding type um, and then the points at infinity is where one component is zero and the only confusing thing here is the following so the classical points are the points uh, where the final coordinate is not zero and you can just scale it out by dividing by that final component or the first component it depends a bit what kind of conventions you'll see whether the x0 component or the xn component is uh, Kind of the one that corresponds to infinity i think i will actually go back to x so most of the time you see x0 right now it's x x n um, but maybe i will go back to x0 anyway so you can have some component where zero that's at the, the point at infinity and the classical components are all the others and in my illustration it, it really just reads uh like this where the point at infinity is something like one zero uh or minus one zero if you want and the the other points are kind of have a non-zero a component backwards and yeah so these are homogeneous coordinates and the only confusing part is so keep in mind projective geometry is different geometry up to scaling and with the angle brackets i mean i identify things up to scalars and the only confusing part is that projective space is kind of always one bigger than uh, one coordinate bigger than classical space because there needs to be room for the point at infinity that's why it counts from zero to n yeah that's why it counts from uh, zero to n uh, and in other words the projective the projective n space has a basis indexed by the same basis as affine n plus one space anyway and where does it all come from well the, the come this idea comes from and you can show in homogeneous coordinates that lines will meet right but how on earth can it work well it really comes from eventually as i said kind of people realize later that it's kind of a great device to get rid of projective uh, projective is a great device to get rid of kind of special cases but it really came from this idea of kind of having the mass of per perspective so when people figured out that we have kind of a perspective drawing it's kind of a fun thing to google that if you uh, are in, into drawings and you look up the older drawings like before 1500 ish they, they don't take any perspective into account they're like flat pictures and later they try to draw 
in a kind of more perspective kind of type of thing uh, when kind of people were looking for the mass behind that and that's where projective geometry comes from so how can how on earth can parallel lines meet well in the same way the two train tracks right the the, the tracks meet at the horizon at the point in at infinity and this idea is actually then just formalized into what a projective space is anyway i hope you enjoyed this video and i also hope to see you next time